very much, everybody, for coming out today. And uh, thank you, Frank, for inviting me to show my work at the gallery here very well. and to have this talk. Uh, my name is Andrew Wirth. The show's name is Soft Curves and Hard Edges. And uh, my strategy for today is to bounce back and forth a little bit about me and a little bit about the work. I'll kind of go back and forth. The work I'm going to talk about is going to start over here and work my way over to this side. But everything's going to be up on the screen. So you can just sit and enjoy. And um, a little bit about me. I was born in New York City, but practically speaking, I'm a New Jerseyan through and through. I lived most of my life in New Jersey. Uh, my early childhood was in Freehold. I consider my hometown to be Teaneck. Um, I had a little detour in California before Teaneck. Um, I went to school for five and a half years in Pittsburgh, lived for a few years in New York, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And uh, for the last uh, 19 years or so, I've been living in Princeton Junction, New Jersey. Um, one of the themes that you'll see in the talk today is that a lot of my work is influenced by the types of things that I like to read. And uh, I read a lot of philosophy, a lot of cognitive science, some math, some popular science. Um, one of the books that uh, I've read and I'll talk a little bit about is called I Am a Strange Loop. Strange loops are one of the ideas that you'll hear a lot about today. Uh, this first painting, all the way on the left, is called Strange Loops Number 3. It's the third one in an ongoing series of paintings I've done. Douglas Hofstetter, who wrote that book, I Am a Strange Loop, uh, first introduced the idea in his book, Gertel Escher Bach, uh, Eternal Golden Braid. And that's something we'll hear about again and again also through today's discussion. Um, Hofstetter is interested in figuring out how it is that uh, animate life can arise from inanimate matter. And one of the sort of metaphors he uses is this, thing, this idea of a strange loop. What I mean by strange loop is not a physical circuit, but an abstract loop in which, in the series of stages that constitute the cycling around, there is a shift from one level of abstraction or structure to another, which feels like an upwards movement in a hierarchy. And yet somehow, the successive upward shifts turn out to give rise to a closed cycle. That is, despite one's sense of departing ever further from one's origin, one winds up, to one's shock, exactly where one had started out. In short, a strange loop is a paradoxical level-crossing feedback loop. Now, one of the ideas that he uses uh, to express what a, a strange loop might be is imagine that you take a camera and point it at a television, and the output of the camera is on the television. Well, what you get is something like this you get this interesting feedback. And as you turn the camera a little bit, you get something that sort of takes on a life of its own. So where is this image, this swirl that you see in the middle? Well, it's a sort of an infinitely recursive kind of video feedback. And after a little while, you get to see these interesting patterns and shapes and uh, swirls and spirals and colors that weren't even there ever. Um, and Hofstetter uses that as one example of how perhaps the mind gives rise to consciousness, some kind of abstract, strange loopiness in the brain that gives us um, the ability to have subjective experience. And um, the, the paintings in this series, um, like this one, which is over here, um, I've explored a number of different ways of trying to capture that idea. Uh, this is the oldest painting in the show. I think it's from 2007. So I don't remember exactly how I made it, but I think what I did was I started with a tessellation, which is a pattern that repeats over and over across a plane, and converted it from rectangular coordinates to polar coordinates. So basically looped it around, and then used that as the, the design for this painting, which I colored in in a way that I thought was going to be visually appealing. Um, the paintings in the series, these are six of the paintings in the series. I've kind of approached the problem a number of different ways, um, from looping like this to here where I kind of use like almost like an eyeball as the compositional elements looping around, um, something with touring patterns, um, a more sort of Fibonacci style spiral, and um, using sines and cosine mathematics to create the loops. So it's a number of different ways that I've uh, explored this idea. Now, when I was a kid, I used to like to draw a lot. 
uh, it was mostly spaceships and rocket ships and things like that. But I also spent hundreds and hundreds of hours working with these coloring books called Altair Designs, which were these geometrically based coloring books where you had these tessellation kind of patterns and you could color them in however you wanted to make whatever kinds of designs you liked. So these were really popular in the late 70s, early 80s um, when I was working on these. And you can see, obviously, how they may have influenced some of my work. But even though I took art in high school as an elective, so I was interested in art, art wasn't always part of my career plan. Um, in fact, from an early age, um, I was very interested in computers, and that was where I envisioned my career going. So even at age 13, I got my first job doing software development um, and then went on to Carnegie Mellon University where I studied computer engineering as an undergrad, information networking in grad school. And out of college, I spent a number of years working at Delcor, building complex telecommunications software systems, and then at CNET, an inter early internet media company where I helped to build some of the software that ran their websites. But I found myself, after a number of years, not doing the creative work that I really enjoyed so much, spending too much time in meetings and performance reviews and budgeting, and I was missing the, the creative work and feeling very, very burnt out. So I left my job, moved to New York, and um, decided to figure out what I'm going to do next. Uh, so I kind of, one of the great things about being in New York in the early 2000s was that almost all the schools allowed adults to audit classes willy-nilly. You could just kind of sign up for whatever you were interested in and take classes. And I started taking classes in philosophy and neuroscience and cognitive science and lots and lots of art classes. So I ended up really loving the art classes and basically gave myself my own sort of self-directed art education. Um, especially I spent a year drawing at the Art Students League, took lots and lots of classes at the uh, School of Visual Arts and the New School. So um, I would take this class, Viewing Art Intelligently, over and over again, and you would kind of learn from looking at all the different classes in New York. And it was a wonderful kind of way to get a, um, a sense of what the art world was like. And I decided this is how I wanted to spend my time, my creative time. So I've now been making art and selling art for basically 20 years now. Um, I thought I would let you know what my paintings actually are. Here's a, a demonstration of how one of my paintings are made. Um, so each painting consists of an underpainting, where in this case there's a swirl of color from yellow to violet. And then on top of the, paint, of the underpainting, I make thousands and thousands of hand-painted little brush strokes of color. I use a mall stick, a handmade mall stick from, made from a curtain rod in this case, and a little grip that I use to help kind of uh, grip my pen. I dip the pen into the palette, pick up the next color, and then make as many marks as I can go. And I just keep going and going until the painting is done. Usually the marks on top of the painting are also a gradient of color, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. And here you can see my palette, what my messy little setup looks like. And then you work your way all the way down to the end, and you finish the piece. Uh, this particular painting is part of a series called Center of Narrative Gravity. Um, I mentioned that I, a lot of my work is about the things that I read. Um, Gertel Escherbach is this book on the left. We'll get to that later. On the right is a book by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson called Philosophy in the Flesh, which their thesis is that the mind is inherently embodied, um, most thought is unconscious, and that much abstract thinking is actually metaphorical. And um, those were ideas that really sort of energized a lot of my early paintings. I kind of tried to think about ways to embody myself in the works through these hand-painted brushstrokes and to think about ways I could incorporate metaphor into the paintings. Um, may not translate as much into the pieces in this show, but it was influential for me early on. The, painting, uh, the book in the middle is called Consciousness Explained by Dan Dennett, one of my favorite books um, about how the mind might possibly give rise to consciousness. He has a couple of different theories. One he calls his multiple drafts theory. But one of the things he talks about is how the self might be like the center of narrative gravity. This picture is from an installation at uh, Art Fair 14C a few years back. These are some of the pieces from that um, series where in physics there's an idea of the center of gravity 
It's not a real thing, but it's a useful abstraction. It's something that helps you make predictions about how things will balance and move around in the world. And Dennett likens the self to the center of narrative gravity. It's not a, the self is perhaps not a real thing, but it's a useful abstraction that helps us to understand how we move around and get around in the world. We are the center of the stories we tell about ourselves. Um, one of the ideas, yeah, one of the ideas that um, people see in a lot of my work is the idea of a fractal. And it's interesting because really not that many of my paintings have fractals in them, but this show has most of the ones that do. So um, for those of you not familiar with what a fractal is, it's a geometrical figure or form that has self-similarity at multiple levels. So again, we're talking about multiple levels of abstraction, things that kind of are repeated and recursing. Um, one example of a fractal is the Sierpinski triangle. So for instance, if you start off with a triangle on the left here, and you remove the center triangle from that, and then you take each remaining triangle and remove the center triangle from that, and so on, and so on, you get a fractal, which is this shape where no matter how much you zoom in, you get self-similarity at multiple levels. So I found that particular construction sort of appealing and um, have used it in a number of paintings in this show. This piece here, which is called Diamond Fractal, um, is, a, is a little bit different than, the, than these, only really in that it's a rectangular format. Um, but you can see if you kind of like let your eyes sort of soften where the Sierpinski triangle is here. You see this orange triangle, and then here's a, another triangle, and a smaller triangle, and a smaller triangle. And if you take two of the Sierpinski triangles and put them, kind of flip them around, and then you make the marks that I showed you before on top in another pattern of Sierpinski triangles, you end up with this particular kind of uh, design. Um, which I find interesting because you can look at it and you can see squares, you can see diamonds, you can see bow ties, triangles. Um, so there's a lot of different things to see depending on kind of where you want to focus your attention. Uh, one of the early books that I read when I was studying art in New York was by Rudolf Arnheim, uh, Art and Visual Perception. He has a number of really interesting books. Um, I wish I could actually read them now. They're, they're like tomes, and I don't think I have the, the, uh, the patience to do it. But back then, I, was, I, I devoured these things. And um, one of the things it talks about is gestalt psychology, which is how is it that the mind can look at shapes and kind of see something greater than the sum of its parts. How does the brain make predictions about the world and see that, you know, here's a, a triangle, even though there's not really a triangle there, you just got cut out circles, right? And what is it that's going on in the brain that makes those kind of perceptions happen? So I like to try and figure out of ways of playing with some of that. So one of the things I did was in this painting, uh, Any Which Way, where I play around with uh, perception and uh, tessellation. So in this piece, you can see it as arrows, like as an axis. You can see it as squares. You can see it as rectangles. You can see it as um, stars. And a tessellation, as I said, again, is a repeated shape throughout the plane. In this painting, there's multiple ways of figuring out what the basic tile is. But if you look at this, and you take this and were to repeat it here and here and here and here, that's how you would tessellate the plane to get to get uh, painting. Let's see if I can go back. Another way to do it would be to divide it like this. If you take this center square and repeat it over and over and over again, you also get this weird kind of construction where you have um, all these different shapes that pop up sort of out of what looks like just sort of a little hexagon, maybe, or axis. Now, when people ask me, what kind of art do you make? What is, how do you describe your art? Sometimes it's tough to come up with a name. Um, but I go back to this article by the artist and art critic Richard Kalina from 2012 in the Brooklyn Rail called The Four Corners of Painting, where Kalina kind of set out a taxonomy for painting art world, basically moving from uh, representational art all the way through to non-representation or abstract art. And uh, one of the things he did, he, he broke down the field of abstraction even further and uh, came up with what he called organized organic abstraction. And it just hit because it's exactly the kind of work that I make. Um, examples of that might be like down on the bottom left here, Barbara Takanaga, James Siena, 
Chuck Close or some of the names you might know. Um, and he describes organized organic abstraction as historically this is an abstracted distillation of 1930s biomorphic Picasso and Moreau. In contemporary painting, this presents itself as a form of abstraction characterized by a more distanced and grammatical approach, often borrowing elements from both geometric and gestural abstractions. So my work is organized. You can tell it's very sort of set up. It's organic, all these thousands of soft edges, soft curves um, that make up the paintings. And it's abstract. There's no representational elements in my work. Um, I like the idea that he describes it as a grammatical approach. So some of the sort of knobs that I turn in designing my paintings are these hand-painted mar maze-like marks of color, uh, touring patterns, which are another kind of pattern that shows up in a lot of my work, but not in this particular show, the color interactions that you see by putting one color on top of another. You can make things push or pull. Symmetry and broken symmetry, tessellations, which I've already mentioned, self-similarity and fractal-like features, and then color gradients. So let's talk about color gradients for a second. So um, most of the paintings that I do have a very subtle color change or multiple color changes. And this is how I go about mixing one of those color palettes up. Usually I'm starting from a light color and working to a dark color, or, but it doesn't have to be. It can kind of move its way around the color wheel. And I'll start at one end and, and the other end, and I'll mix a nine-step gradient in between. And it just takes a little while because I have to try and make it as perceptually even as I can. And once I've gotten it down to nine, then I will, uh, see, I've got to work my way back a little bit until I get it just about perceptually even. And then you, I mix in between each of those nine. I mix another eight individual steps, so that gives me 17 steps. And then once I've done the 17 steps, I mix in between each of those, another 16 um, color swatches. And in the end, I end up with a 33-step color gradient. Um, that I can then use to make my painting. So when you come and look at these pieces later on, if you look up close, you'll see how the colors shift. And 33 steps is enough steps to most of the time make it look like it's a gradual transition in the painting. So for instance, in this piece here, you can see how the blue marks start light blue in the middle. And as they move towards the end, they end up a dark blue. And the yellow marks start off as a bright yellow orange, but by the time they reach the end of the painting, they're a dark, middle dark green. And that sort of changes the color interactions that are going on over the plane of the painting. Um, I gave a talk a few years ago uh, to the Color Society of Australia about the use of color effects in my work. And uh, one of the attendees was an art educator, an artist and designer, who was working on a book on color principles. And she asked me if, I could, if, if she could include one of my paintings in her book. And I was thrilled because I love color theory. <laughs> so it was very nice to have, even though it's just this tiny little image in the book, um, in the uh, chapter of Universal Principles of Color about how transparency effects can be achieved through using color. So for instance, in this painting here, the blue looks somewhat like it's uh, got some transparency. You can kind of see through it. And um, let's take, let's zoom in on one of these little squares down at the bottom left here. What we have is the underpainting, you can see an orange triangle, right? It's the orange triangle. And then uh, the other half of the square is a very deep, it's a little hard to see, like a purple maroon. And then the marks on top of it are the start of a blue gradient and the start of a, or the end, I guess, of a, of a purplish gradient. And those four sort of color combinations, your eye will read them as four different sort of colors optically integrating those things together. So as you zoom out, it starts to look like there's four different colors there um, based on uh, just the way the eye integrates the background and the foreground together. Uh, the last of the Sierpinski squared paintings actually has very similar colors to this one, but depending on which colors you start in the middle and which colors you put at the end and which colors you overlap with other ones, you can end up making a piece that has a very different sort of visual effect. 
So back to Gertel Escher Bach, uh, an eternal golden braid. Um, one of the things that um, I mentioned before, he's worried about in the book is how is it that animate beings can come out of inanimate matter and how can he explain consciousness as um, a recursive self-referential structure and processes within the brain. He does this by talking about um, mathematician Gödel, um, the artist Escher, who you're probably familiar with. You know, you've seen all the arm, the hand drawing the hands, one of the Escher sort of strange loops drawings. Um, Bach, a musician who used canons and fugues in his work, which have this also cyclical sort of property that Hofstadter thinks is like a strange loop. Um, you may have heard of the Penrose Triangle or the Impossible Triangle. Uh, Roger Penrose is a physicist who, with his father in the 1950s, came up with this figure, although it had probably been uh, invented or drawn up um, before then. But um, you're all sort of familiar with this. It's the impossible triangle. If you tried to follow it around on the screen, uh, on, the, on the triangle, you, could re you realize that this is not an, uh, something that could exist in real life. Um, and Escher used this kind of idea in many of his drawings, including this one with the stairs, relativity, but if you start in one spot and start walking up and keep walking up and keep walking up, suddenly you're back where you started. So that's exactly like the kind of strange loop that Hofstetter was talking about. So I wanted to explore this idea a little bit in some of my paintings um, and decided to use the impossible triangle as sort of my, the compositional element. Um, when I was getting ready for the show, I was trying to think, oh, how, did, how do I actually make this piece? And I was looking at it again. It's really kind of complicated to figure out what's going on when you just look at it, these two pieces. But I found on my hard drive some of my old design uh, uh, images. These are not exactly the ones that I found, but it's close enough. And the, the one painting, Reality Construction Number 2, um, was made with an underpainting, which is roughly sort of a rainbow. Uh, red, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet kind of uh, color painting. It doesn't quite show up here uh, so much on the screen. And then the mark making was marks made of this impossible triangle with a similar color pat progression. Red, yellow, green, blue, sort of indigo, violet, uh, working their way down. And when you put them together, you end up with one of these, these pieces. Um, the other piece in the series, Reality Construction Number 1, same kind of progression, a little bit different, but I also decided just to add some waviness to it. And the idea is, how is it that we make sense of the world by putting together these pieces that seem kind of impossible, but when you look at them just right, it looks like there's something solid there. Um, so it was just kind of an idea that I've been toying around with for some time. And then the most recent painting in the show um, called Diamonds. I thought I'd show you some pictures of this piece in progress. Um, one of the things about making hard-edged paintings is you need a lot of masking tape. And in this piece, um, you mask out the sections, and then you um, apply some opaque paint. You let it dry. Then you apply another layer to make sure that it's opaque. Um, peel off the paint, apply it to another section, peel off the tape, I should say, apply more paint, keep going. Eventually, you have the underpainting finished. Um, so here, this is what the underpainting looked like. Then I mixed up my color palette. And you can see here that I applied the greens and blues first because they're a little bit more melted on the palette, so you can see that they've been there longer. Um, and then the other uh, gradient is the orange to deep violet. And when you put those on the piece, you can start to see here I've applied the uh, green to blue marks. And then when the piece is finished, here's how it looks. So we're going to be, re we're going to be replacing this piece, thankfully, because we have a collector. Um, and there's a, a new piece that's going to be joining the show. It's called Connections. I've mentioned a couple times the idea of tessellations and the books that I read. I have a lot of books on tessellations. I think I'm actually better perhaps at buying them than, than reading them all, but um, I find it 
kind of interesting and fun to play with them. I thought I would show you one of the tools that I've used in the past, not so much lately, but in the past, there was a program called Kali. It's a freely available tool you could download. And what you can do is you can pick a symmetry group. There are 17 symmetry groups in, known in mathematics that repeat. And you get a grid then on your screen, and you can kind of draw around, uh, change colors if you want, and you'll get the symmetries automatically played out for you. So it's really fun to kind of explore this and just see what you got. Then you can change the symmetry pattern, and now it's a, a triangular uh, one. Um, play around with the symmetry there. And one of the things about Kali is it's not that sophisticated in terms of your ability to go back and edit and, and, and change things, but um, you could easily lose yourself designing these patterns. And then I've used these kinds of designs in, in some of my paintings. Sometimes I would start them as rectangular forms and later on turn them into like strange loops. I think that's what I did for the, this first piece here. Um, and I think I have one more design. So that's called Cali. And on that painting, you can see the repetitive tile, um, which is this little di uh, triangle here, which is um, sort of like um, threads coming around. And if you repeat that over and over six times in the hexagon, plus a few times around the corners, you end up with the final piece, which is called connections. And oddly enough, this sort of helps tie everything together with tessellations and strange loops. And look at that, a golden braid tying everything together. So thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Um, when you take any shape, but often let's just say it's a square, and you repeat it over and over and over again until you fill up like a plane, so a, um, a canvas. So um, this one is an easy, well, it's a little bit complicated, but if you take a certain shape and you repeat it over and over again, you get a tessellation. You could do it with triangles, though, too. You can do it with uh, pentagon. Mm, actually, I'm not sure you can do it with pentagons. There's a whole bunch of mathematicians trying to figure out all the different ways that you can fill up um, an infinite plane with the same shape repeating over and over again. In fact, there was some really interesting mathematical news this past year where some uh, mathematicians came up with a, uh, a non-repeating tile where you could take one tile and you could repeat it over and over and over again and fill up with no gaps like a puzzle, but it would never repeat. There was no two spots in the infinite plane that were exactly the same as any others. And so that's an area of ongoing. What was that? that was Craig Kaplan, um, who's in University of Waterloo, I think, yeah. up in Canada. He's one of the, one of the authors. The yeah. There's a, um, there's a um, conference every year called Bridges, where it's um, mathematicians and artists get together and share ideas about the intersection between math and art. And uh, I've met Craig, Craig Kaplan there. He tends to be one of the, one of the people who organizes it. Um, and it's a fun conference to go to and get a chance to see what people are doing. It tends to be more mathematicians doing arty things and some artists doing mathy things. So um, it's a great question. I've, um, it's probably changed a little bit over the years. Early on, I was looking at those books that I showed you, and I was reading something, and I would have an idea of some topic, and I would say, how do I want to express that idea in the painting? And then I would try and work on a design. These days, um, I do that sometimes, but I tend to be more formally working. So I have an idea for shapes and geometry or um, some kind of way I want to make a painting with the, the math, or, um, and then I'll start from that. Um, I then, for a lot of the pieces, I will design the, the painting on a computer to help me kind of explore. And I'll try out dozens and do dozens of color combinations to see which one I think is gonna, is gonna work and express what I wanna do. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, the pieces in this show don't really, mostly don't require computers. Um, you could do a lot of this stuff by hand, like the Sierpinski triangle pieces are 
I took a ruler actually and measured out the, and, and you know, drew everything on the canvas to divide up all the shapes. Um, the, the, a lot of the work that I've done in recent years are based on what are called Turing patterns, which are these mathematical, biological kinds of shapes that occur mathematically the way that like zebra stripes or giraffe spots occur. And th for that, I, would, I need the computer because I have to basically simulate the mathematics of that biological um, happening. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I loved to draw when I was younger, and I loved the book Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, actually. Uh, one of the first classes I took when I moved to New York was a, a five-day class at the Open Center, which was this funky place downtown where you could take all kinds of weird classes. And, and one was a drawing class uh, called, based on the Betty Edwards book Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And you, know, you go in, and everybody comes, goes into the class with, like, stick figure, and they come out five days later with these, you know, beautifully shaded drawings that are proportionally just right, trying to figure out how to turn off the critical part of your brain that says, that doesn't look like a nose. I know what a nose looks like. Mm -hmm. And you, what you really want to do is train yourself to see. And that's a, a, where we first just look at your objects and be drawing over here, but not watching. <laughs> that's one of the ways of doing it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. I don't draw. So. You know, the. Or turning an image upside down. Turning it up, yeah. So, like, something as simple as that. If you have a picture that you're trying to draw, mm -hmm. draw it upside down. Huh. Because that will take away what he's saying is that it's all your thoughts of what an image looks like, rather, you'll start seeing the shapes of it. And then you'll, I guarantee you, when you turn it back right around, it's, oh my gosh, this is way better. Yeah, Glass of wine helps, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Oh, um, the oh, what was I just thinking about? Um, oh, there's uh, there's a prominent um, Instagrammer. Uh, his name was Art Pete Three Pete. Yeah. And he brought you up. Uh, uh, you your virtual Moncel color system. Yeah. You speak about your like what Moncel is and what you did with that. Sure. It was really nice. I suddenly noticed I was getting a bunch of new Instagram followers out of the blue and that my website traffic, which is usually like this, suddenly was like this. And um, this guy that I follow on Instagram, his name is Peter Donahue, has a really wonderful Instagram feed um, uh, about color theory. He, he does makes these fun little videos about how colors work. Um, and he ended up profiling a tool that I put online about more than 10 years ago called the Virtual Munsell Color Wheel. And... Um, uh, I recently relaunched a new version of it, and that's probably why he found it. And what it is is uh, the Munsell color space is a way of describing colors. It was invented by Alfred Munsell uh, in the early 1900s, and it breaks colors into hues, which are, we think of as what color is it, you know, as it goes around the color wheel, value, which is light to dark, and chroma, which is how far away a color is from neutral of the same value. So you can kind of describe any color uh, based on the hue, value, and chroma. And it's a very nice, perceptually even color wheel um, for breaking down color space. And there are a lot of painters online who actually use it as a, um, as a way of kind of helping them match colors that they're seeing in like a still life to the paints they're mixing on their, on their uh, palette. They can take these color chips that are published or used to be published as the Munsell color book and if you, you, you kind of squint and you see that the color of the apple is a certain red, and you, make, you find the chip that matches, and then you can go down to your palette and you can mix a color that matches that chip, um, then you can make a very accurate painting. So anyway, what I did was I built an online tool that lets you click through the color space of the Munsell color wheel. You can select a hue, and then you can select a chip from a page of colors. I don't think I had it on here. Um, and uh, from there, you can um, uh, then see the RGB value or the hex value of that color. If you say you are a designer and you're building a website or you're working in Photoshop and you need to pick a color from the, uh, the color wheel. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a very, it's a very valuable tool because the, I think it was, a, it, the, it was originally like this like object you would get. Right? Yeah. And now like Pantone doesn't right. sell it anymore. So 
it's like it, someone they own it, but they're not like using it in any way. So your your tool is very valuable for colorists that want to use that. Yeah, it's 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 kind of sad that they're not making the book anymore right. because, but it was a very expensive. It was like a thousand dollars, and it would come with hundreds and hundreds of little color chips that were precisely calibrated to fit into this this color space. And um, not only could you use it for artists as color, but they made subsets of the color, uh, color book that like soil scientists would use. So they would go out into the field and say, ah, this soil is a, you know, five red, yellow, three slash six, right? And that would be a way of kind of matching the colors of the soils they were finding for making detailed uh, recordings. And I don't know if any of that is still being sold or not, but... No, no. It was you know I used to be part of this um, this online community kind of before Facebook kind of killed all those things. It's called Rational Painting, and it was a group of artists who um, talked about art, and a lot of them were uh, using the Munsell system. And I had learned Munsell in my color theory class when I was in New York, and I thought it was always very interesting. But I don't didn't really use it in my painting. But um, being a former programmer, I kind of thought it would be interesting to try and build an online tool that would um, make it easy for people who wanted to kind of explore that color space, um, you know. Uh, so I, I just kind of built it as a little web page online. Yeah, really cool. You can find it if you go to andrewworth.com and then uh, click on Munsell. Mm. Yeah. I just love how we don't have sun charts or days. And when I look at mm. these two, the centers are vibrant. Thank I you. I realize that's the yeah. color of these. Yeah. Know, but it's wonderful because I feel like I'm seeing reflection. Thank you very much. Yes. One of the. <laughs> yeah. I think that's an interest. Do you talk about the. Like, uh, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one, one of the. Uh, you know, I mentioned that book, A Philosophy in the Flesh. And um, one of the metaphors that they talk about is how light is often used as a metaphor for knowledge. Seeing is believing, or seeing is knowing. You um, put shine a light on something if you want to get a better idea of what it is. And so a lot of my paintings, I was using the idea of self-illumination in the middle as a... Uh, yeah. So. Right. Can you, can you speak to that a little bit, like the, the illusion of color? Yeah. Um, that's always one of these uh, topics that gets you in trouble if you talk about it on Twitter with uh, other philosophers. Um, um, where does color exist? Is the color in the paint? Is the color in you know, the wall? Or is the color really just a construction of your brain? And I'm of the um, point of view that it's, there is no real color in the world. Uh, color is a subjective ph phenomenon that occurs when light uh, of certain wavelengths bounces off of certain objects, which reflect some of that light but not others of that light into our eyes. And our eyes are particularly tuned to certain wavelengths of color. And our brain is basically has evolved to distinguish those patterns of wavelengths as they hit our eye, and we see them as colors. But, um, you know, a different animal who has a different sort of embodied mind or different eyes might see colors completely differently. Right. And honeybees can see totally different ultraviolet. Um, yeah, if you look at the light spectrum, it's like this big, and this is how humans become. <laughs> yeah. This is like infrared and ultraviolet. Yeah. And then we do a little slice. <laughs> yeah. That's this human visual yep. you know, perception. Yeah. Yeah, that is a good question. I've changed over the years. Um, when I first started painting, I used to use 3,000 Kelvin uh, tungsten bulbs um, because that was um, that had the highest color rendering index, which was it meant that the colors were were reproducible accurately. But 
we don't, nobody wants to use tungsten bulbs these days anyway. Yeah. 3000 is actually a very warm color temperature, so the light is very yellow. Um, I've tried a number of different uh, bulbs. These days I'm using, I think most recently I put 3500 Kelvin LED bulbs into my studio, ones that have a very high CRI, which is the color rendering index, which means that um, if you took a, a spectrum of colors of medium saturation and lit it with this light, you would get very precise, good color rendering. I know a lot of artists like to use daylight, um, you know, much cooler colors in their studio, like it would be this kind of almost uh, color. I personally find that a little bit too cool to paint by, and I'd like to have something that's a little bit more close to the color that most people have in their homes. And it used to be the case that all galleries were using warmer light. They would use, this is probably, these are probably 3000 Kelvin. Um, and I wanted to see what my work looked like. Um, so, uh, but now I'm using mostly 3,500 Kelvin bulbs. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, and um, I want to bring up the point about uh, what's wonderful about this, the way you work in here, especially in the series, is that you can't, it's hard, I, for me, it's hard to tell what's the background and what's the foreground. Where did you start and where did you end? Right. So it looks like, is this when you from from I mean probably up close you can see where the mark making is but from far away you can't tell if it's like is this a green line on a purple background or is it a purple right. line on a green background right sometimes I look at them I think I have to remember which way I did it yeah so, so I mean. like can you, yeah. can you speak to that about the, how how to view it from a distance and like, yeah you know I think it was um who was this the, the, someone I met at like when I was at school so the paintings are experienced in three ways five inches five feet and fifteen. Yeah. Like there's three ways, there's three versions that you can experience. So, yeah. If you, you know, come up to the piece close, you can see the individual marks and you can kind of say, oh, I like those marks or not. And I, I like that the yellow is on top of the red and that's interesting. And as you move away, you know, you think about how when you look at a magazine, they're made up of thousands of little dots of color when you look through a magnifying glass. And it's as you move it away that your eye kind of optically blends those colors together. And the same kind of thing happens with my paintings. As you move away, you start to see less and less of the individual marks, and you see more a merging of the colors together. And it can sort of happen a couple different ways, but, but um, mostly it's just sort of kind of like the way pointillists did their, some of their work. Um, you put one color next to another, and you have enough of them together. Um, and or impressionism the, is that. Yeah, impressionism, yeah, yep. You, you optically mix. Right. You know. Right. Which, which works to a point. It works to a point, and there, there are some things you can play with. Um, because these marks have a certain texture that is consistent through the painting, your eye kind of looks for that, and there are other sorts of illusions that can occur based on, um, you know, I think that's why in, uh, let's say, probably that third painting over there, it looks like there's depth because the color gradient falls off in a certain way, your eye reads that as it must be getting darker somehow because it's shaded or curved physically in space. So uh, one of the ways of playing with the, the color interactions. This one here, you mentioned that they were uh, yellow over the red. And to me, I was seeing red put over the yellow. Oh, yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. Exactly right. yeah. Well, and also an interesting thing is here at the, so here it's yellow over red, and as you go out, that gradient becomes green, and you have red and green, green on top of the red, but if you know about color theory, you put red and green next to each other, and you stand far back, you actually get yellow. So with this piece, you know, if you squint and you kind of move back, you don't see red and you don't see green, you kind of see that square as being yellow. Um, so... It's an interesting thing how here it's red and yellow. It just kind of makes it look orange when you stand further away. And as you get back, the, the, end up, the red yeah, and green look yellow. So actually, another interesting point. I want to get your take on the, the differences in pigment primaries and light primaries. So can you speak to that a little bit, like how they're different, they're different animals? Right? Yeah. Well, so the whole idea of primary colors, right? We learn it in grade school, a lot of us, you know, that it's the primaries are red, yellow, and blue. Well, it's not really true. There's no such thing, actually, as primary colors. Um, it's a useful idea that a lot of color theorists have, have taught 
people over the years, but in fact, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's really a fiction. You can, with paints that are subtractive paints, like watercolors that are transparent, pick three colors, and with those three colors, you can mix a large gamut of colors, but those aren't necessarily the primaries. There's no perfect three primaries. You can find three that might be better than any other paints you can pick in order to get a big gamut. But if you pick um, opaque paints instead of transparent paints, you will pick slightly different three colors if you wanted to only pick three. There's really no, no reason to pick three because remember, the primaries are a fiction. With light, if you add light together optically, you can also have, uh, you can pick a red and a green and a blue, and with those three lights, if you add them up by shining spotlights onto a white screen, you can create a decent gamut of colors through the spectrum. In fact, that's how our monitors work on the screen. You have red, green, and blue pixels, and through those three colors, you can create a pretty good range of colors. But those primaries are just conventional. They're not magic in any kind of color theory sense. They can perhaps closely match the cones in our eyes um, better than some other three primaries might. But you remember a few years ago, there was a TV that came out that had a red, green, and blue, and I think it had a yellow pixel also, because it turns out that, well, if you have a yellow pixel, you can actually make brighter yellows than if you just use red and green. So what are the three, what are the primaries? There's not really um, one fixed set of primaries. Yeah, so my most frequently asked question is, uh, is how long do your paintings take to make? Um, and uh, they take usually two to three days for the smallest pieces, like a 12 by 12, up to two or three weeks for the largest pieces, um, maybe a little bit longer than that for some of the really larger pieces. Um, but what I'm using is acrylic paints, and it's, it's called a stay wet palette. So the palette is a tray. Um, and in the tray, you put either a sponge or, in my case, I use um, nine-fold, not nine-fold, it's probably four-fold um, paper towels that you moisten with water. And on that top of that, you put a special sheet of palette paper that absorbs the water through the uh, paper towels and keeps the paints just wet enough so that if I seal the uh, unit with the cover, I can keep it going for several weeks at a time um, without the acrylics drying up. Now the problem is it, the problem is it tends to, uh, the, the paints do tend to get a little soupy after a while and you have to worry about getting moldy and things like that. So I try very hard not to let the paints last that long uh, and, and get, once I've mixed them up, I wanna start working and you know, finish using them as soon as I can so that they don't uh, get soupy or dry up on me. Yeah. So you mix ads, do you paint every day? I don't paint every day. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of design work that goes into ahead of time. There's a lot of thinking ahead of time. Then there's a lot of canvas prep and varnishing at the end and things like that. Um, and then I also spend a lot of time reading, trying to think about what I want to do next. And then there's also the, just the business of putting things on your website and doing social media and all that other stuff. So yeah, plus it is a little bit tiring on the fingers. And so I do need to give myself, uh, myself breaks. <laughs> yeah. That's why I show the video all the time because people think it's a stencil. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, I started off doing computers, which also isn't so great for the fingers and the wrist. But you know, what can you do? Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.